And in her sermon, she, and it was, it was wonderful. It was just so good just to sit. I'm like, oh, this is what it's like to be you, to just come and like worship together. It's just so good to sit and to participate, but as someone who is being led. And she shared a hymn from a early church father named Simeon from like the turn into like the 1000s, okay? That's how old this hymn is. And it's a hymn about how Christ is in us. Christ is in us. And so I want to read this hymn to you, hymn number 15, and it will lead us into just a brief time of confession. We awaken in Christ's body. So Christ is in us and we are in Christ. As Christ awakens in our bodies. And my poor hand is Christ. He enters my foot and is infinitely me. I move my hand and wonderfully my hand becomes Christ, becomes all of him. For God is indivisibly whole, seamless in his godhood. I move my foot and at once he appears like a flash of lightning. Do my words seem blasphemous? Then open your heart to him. And let yourself receive the one who is opening to you so deeply. For if we genuinely love him, we wake up inside Christ's body, where all our body, all over, every most hidden part of it, is realized as joy in him. And he makes us utterly real. And everything everything that is hurt, everything that seemed to us dark and harsh and shameful, maimed, ugly, irreparably damaged, is in him transformed and recognized as whole, as lovely and radiant in his light as we awaken as the beloved in every last part of our body. We are the body of Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the truth that we find in Scripture and the early church and we find is real in us today. That we are your body. That you are in us. We pray at Christmas that you would be born in us today. God, we pray that we would see within us ourselves, but also within our brothers and sisters, our siblings gathered here, the beauty of your son Jesus. And we pray that whatever needs transformation in our lives, that you would do that work, that we would open ourselves up to you fully so that you may fully transform all that needs your healing, your touch, your beauty, your light. And so in these moments, we acknowledge your presence in us and among us. God, we thank you for your forgiveness and transformation. And we pray that we would live into that every day of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words of assurance are from the book of Colossians, the book that Carol has been leading you through for these last few weeks. The first chapter, in the first chapter, Paul talks about the mystery, the mystery that he is now being able to show and reveal to all the world, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To us, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. And what is that mystery? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. So at this time, I get to invite the children forward. So if kids could come forward just to this area right here, Amelia and Zoe are already populating it. We're just going to add some Reuben and some Logan and Evan and any other kids and Landon and Preston. And yeah, 
about Oliver. Come on forward. I want to talk to you about something that happened 10 years ago and something that happened last week or two weeks ago. Or right here, too. There might not be enough room for ever. So just, yeah, we have lots of kids this morning. Woohoo! That's awesome. Maybe right here. Here, we can move this. And there can be some seats right there. Okay. All right. You know what? Like right there, right there. Could you sit there? Or even on the floor. The floor is good, too. That's good. Oh, yes. Okay, the floor. So much easier. Okay. You're sitting on the floor. You know what? I'm going to... Jesse, can I sit and you still see me if I sit? Okay, I'm going to sit too. All right. You have a key. Do you want to sit down too on the floor, crisscross applesauce? Your grandma gave you a key. I love it. What does it open? Nothing. <laughs> like the door to heaven? Is that what we're thinking? We've got lots of, lots of plans for this key. That's wonderful. Well, welcome. It's so good to see you all. So first I'm going to tell you something about what happened 10 years ago. 10 years ago today. Ten, are any of you 10 years old? Any of you 10? You're 10 already. You're over 10 over there. The rest of you up here weren't even born yet 10 years ago. How is that possible? Well, 10 years ago today, my family and I, my girls were all whoop, a lot younger and we crossed the border to move into Canada 10 years ago today. Isn't that amazing? I know. We moved here. Yay, yes, it was so good. Yay. But we were nervous because we'd never lived in Canada before. We didn't know how wonderful all of you were. It was like this big adventure that we were going to go on, and we didn't know what was going to happen and how it was going to be. So we were a little nervous. Are you ever a little bit nervous to do something new? A little bit, little bit nervous sometimes to do a new thing? You are, Ruben, sometimes? Yeah? You were nervous to try to do a front flip on his trampoline. I would be nervous too. Did you do it? <gasps> Congratulations. You got courage. That's right. This is the courage of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Woohoo! You did it. So that kind of reminds me of something that happened a couple of weeks ago. I went to Animal Kingdom in Disney World. Oh my goodness, it was so fun. And we went on a ride, a very fun and scary ride. It was called the Flight of Passage, okay? So it was like, it was a ride where it felt like we were flying. And we got to sit on this thing that was kind of like a bicycle, and we were tight harnessed in like this, and we went like this, and it felt like we were riding on the back of what's called a mountain banshee. Oh my goodness. And this, there was a huge screen in front of us, and we had 3D glasses on, and it felt with the wind that was coming in our face and the water that they were spraying on us, that we were flying through the land of Pandora. This is like a movie set that we were kind of on. So we were flying over waterfalls and up high in the sky. But beforehand, I was a little bit nervous to go on this ride, just like you were nervous to do a front flip on the trampoline, just like I was nervous a year ago to move to a different country. Well, right before the ride, we had a message from a scientist, okay? She was just an actor, but she was she was telling us about this ride and what was, it was going to be like. And she said some words that I looked up on the internet later because they were so good. She said that there was going to be a guide that was going to lead us. So when we were going, there was somebody in front of us, and it was like we were following them, okay? A Navi guide. So a Navi is like the, the people who lived in Pandora. And she said, you'll experience the breathtaking beauty of Pandora but you also might face some of its greatest challenges, things that were hard like flying down a waterfall or doing a front flip. Some of this flight might be intense. That means really hard, she said. But trust your guide and be brave. I thought that was so good. Trust your guide and be brave. When we were moving to Canada, we could know we could trust our guide, and our guide is God. God guides us, right, and leads us wherever we go. And then she said, as the Navi say during this important rite of passage, Sivako, 
which means rise to the challenge. So we felt like we could rise to the challenge to do this ride. I thought, what a neat word, sivako. Can you say that? Sivako means rise to the challenge. So I'm not sure what challenges you're facing right now. Maybe it's a front flip. Maybe you're going to do a back flip next. No? You want to learn how to do a back flip? Maybe it's going to school for the first time. Anyone going to SK or JK for the first time this coming year? Yeah, Landon, you are. Or maybe it's going to a different school or a different place. You're going to go to a different school. Sometimes we're, we're going to be a little nervous sometimes, but Savako, rise to the challenge. Follow your guide, because God is guiding you, and be brave. Can I pray for you? Okay. Dear God, we thank you so much that you lead us wherever we go, and we thank you that sometimes the ride and the journey is a little bit scary, but it's also beautiful, and most importantly, you are our guide, and you are leading us, and with the Holy Spirit in us, we can rise to the challenge. So I pray for my friends here as they face whatever is next in their life. May they be strong and courageous. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So with wondrousness, you guys get to go to Kingdom Kids. Chloe wasn't able to come today, but Shannon is going to lead Kingdom Kids. So thankful. I think is that your aunt? It might be a little bit of vacation time for Chloe. She's been working really hard. All right. Have fun in Kingdom Kids. Wonderful. Yes. Dance. Okay. All right. So I am getting over a little bit of a summer cold. Tested negative. Just letting you know. But my voice is a little bit compromised today. So I apologize for that. Hmm. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Now, typically I preach from memory, and I'm going to do that again today, except today I'm going to use some slides, and for the sake of Jesse and the sake of myself, I'm going to have my notes nearby just to make sure that we're on the same page, on the same track. So Carol has been leading you through several different texts in the book of Colossians, and I get to finish that series today. We don't touch all the texts in Colossians, but we touch several of them, and this week is from Colossians 3, 1 to 11. And I wanted to show you a book that was really helpful to me. I don't know, did you use this book when you were Colossians Remixed? Doesn't look familiar? Okay, this was in my study. Carol has full access to my study, so I thought maybe she used it, but Colossians Remixed by Brian Walsh and Sylvia Kiesmont. Um, and so, just so you know, this is a book where I got a lot of the resources for today. And Colossians 3, 1 to 11, I'm going to offer a prayer as we enter the text together today. <clears throat> Dear God, we thank you so much for leading us, and we thank you for your word that leads and guides us. We thank you most of all. For the one that your word points to, the word made flesh, Jesus, who is the name above all names, who is our Savior and our friend, and who is the one who has overcome and in whose footsteps we now walk. We pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of this word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians 3, 1 to 11. Paul writes, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died... And your life is now hidden in Christ with God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. 
You used to walk in these ways in the life, life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger and rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of his creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in preparation for this message, I... I didn't watch through, but I read through Carol's messages that she gave so that I could kind of make sure, you know, we were on the same page together. And one of the things I was struck by was something that she shared in her very first message, which was called the triad of grace, the Pauline triad of grace. And so we have a slide up here to show that triad of grace. And this was really rooted in Colossians 1, the prayer that Paul offers there, where he with gratitude, talks about the Colossian Christians' faith in Christ, their love for people, and their hope for the future. And these three themes we find explicitly in Colossians 1, but we find them in a lot of Paul's writing. And so when I turned to Colossians 3, I said, you know, I think I can see, especially if we also include the verses following this, 12 to 17, all three of these themes echoing throughout Colossians 3 faith in Christ, love for people, hope in the future. And so we're going to unpack these points today. Um, The other thing that was clear from all of Carol's messages is that in each message she found like a duality or a polarity, like a kind of opposite that Paul was getting at. So in her first message she talked about darkness and light and her second message about alienation and reconciliation and her third message she talked about death and life. And so as I was in Colossians 3, I was like, what what polarity or duality is Paul getting at here? And I think we see very clearly that Paul is talking about the difference between our old self, our earthly nature, and how we need to put that off. And thank God this is something God does for us, okay? Taking off our earthly nature isn't something we just do in our own power but also that we are to put on our new self, our new nature. Paul talks about this in lots of ways throughout his letters, but he kind of, sometimes he talks about clothing ourselves with Christ, like putting Christ on as if Christ were clothes. And so that duality is in this text as well. And so for today, I'm going to be going through, and you can see here all three of those, faith in Christ, love for people, and hope for the future, but talking about how in each of those, in each of those points, there is a, both a taking off of the old self and a putting on of the new self, all right? So those, those three points with the two subpoints in each one. So give me a triangle. I'm going to finally give you a three-point sermon. That's just how it goes. It's rare, but it happens. All right. So our chapter starts with just a beautiful description of what our faith in Christ is, that we, we have been raised with Christ. That's the first bit. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And then this is one of my very favorite verses. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. I love this verse. I love thinking about being hidden with Christ in God. It gives me such a sense of safety that I am in God and nothing, nothing can take me out of God's care. Nothing can take me out of God's hand. And I am with Christ there, but in a sense I'm also in Christ, right? That I am clothed with Christ. Christ is all around me. Carol titled this series that that Christ overcomes. Christ overcomes and Christ comes over me, right? It's another way to think about overcoming, coming over. I have a friend who will often say, what's the worst that can happen? And then she answers her own question and says, there is no worst that can happen. For you died. The worst that can happen is already done. 
and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You are safe. And so part of what it means to put on the new self is to claim with faith that faith in Christ, that trust in the one who has come over us and the one who is all around us. Therefore, from that place, we can set our mind on things above, not on earthly things. I love how, and this is my, um, my message version of this, um, of the Bible, by Eugene Peterson, the translation that he gives. This is Eugene Peterson's translation of the first few verses of Colossians 3. He says, So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. The first time I read that, that is a, that is a change from what we usually think about when we think about setting our minds on things that are above, right? We usually think about, oh, I need to set my minds on the heavenly realms and think about heaven and Jesus at the right hand of God and the clouds and the angels. Like, I think that's kind of where our minds go usually when we read that. And there's nothing wrong with thinking about that. But sometimes when we think about heaven and if that's all we're setting our minds on is what's, what's to come and what we can't think, we can become so heavenly minded. I'm quoting like dozens of people who said this, we become so heavenly minded, we are of no earthly good, all right? So Eugene Peterson's translation is so helpful because the look up isn't like look up, but like instead of just being preoccupied with what's going on around your feet and absorbed with what's happening right in front of you, look up. Look up to what Christ is doing. When we think about Christ reigning at the right hand of the Father, We think about all the things over which Christ presides. His power, his kingdom. And I'm so sorry, Jesse. I'm sure I'm getting way off track here. But this is the look up that we are invited to. We see this in Acts chapter 1 when um, Jesus has ascended into heaven, right? And all of those people are, look. they watch, they look, whoa, there he goes into the clouds. And they're looking up. And the angels say what? Why are you looking up into the sky? (laughs) Why are you looking up into the sky? Jesus is going to come back the same way he left you. What they needed to do was to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Spirit and get to work. And get to work over the things that Christ cared about. And get to work loving God and loving their neighbor and showing other people how to do that. So part of what it means to put on the new self when it comes to our faith in Christ is to trust in the one in whom we are hidden but also to look up and see the ways in which Christ is working in this world and set our minds on those things. So if when it comes to our faith in Christ, putting our new self on looks like this, what does it mean to take off? What does it mean to take off our old selves? If Paul says to not focus on the earthly things, but to focus on the things that are above. What is that contrast? What does it mean to take off our earthly nature? And this question gets right at the question of what is sovereign in your life? What is your ultimate concern? What is the organizing principle of your life, okay? We are invited to have Christ be the organizing principle, the sovereign, the ultimate in our life. But so often, other things become that ultimate. And Walsh and Kiesma in their book talk about this, and we kind of paraphrase how they talked about it. They say that human beings are created in such a way that, that we want to give our allegiance to something. We want to, we want to be a part of something bigger. We want, to, we want to worship something. We want to focus in on an ultimate concern. We have that seed of religion, that seed of spirituality, that seed of a desire to to count something as sovereign in us. 
And when we seek, when, when we turn away from our Creator, the one who's, who, in whose image we're made, the one whom we are supposed to be <laughs> in relationship, we tend then to turn to something else in creation and make that the sovereign, the thing, okay? And so what was a good aspect of creation becomes instead an idol for us, idolatry. This next slide here, idolatry, giving ultimacy to some aspect of creatureliness. This is, this is the old self. This is what we tend to do and what we're invited to take off. And that might be any number of things. I've seen in some of Carol's sermons, different things she's talked about, places where we might put our ultimate kind of trust or our attention. Walsh and Keyes might talk about, you know, how that might be fertility or security or technological power or scientific analysis or um, accumulation of wealth, right? There's all sorts of things that we tend to give are all. And that becomes the organizing principle and focus for our life. A focus on creatureliness instead of on the creator. So you can stop, share there. So Paul's invitation then is to take off, take off that old self that tends to find a gift and focus in on it and to put on our new self of trust in God and also of looking up and focusing on the things over which Christ presides. So that was the first point. It was the longest point. I promise they get shorter as we go. All right. So the first point was faith in Christ. Faith in Christ as the top of that triad. The second one has to do with our love for people and what Paul was saying to the Colossian Christians about their love for people. And we're going to string that first through the putting off of our old nature. What does it look like when it comes to that call to love people to take off our earthly nature? What does our earthly nature look like in opposition to love for people? Well, our earthly nature looks like things that kill community and hurt people. And Paul says in a whole bunch of different ways in the bulk of our verses for today that we need to get rid of that right? In verse 5, he talks about, um, let's see, in verse 5, he talks about putting our nature, old nature, to death. Like, the language is really strong. And then in verse 8, he talks about ridding ourselves of practices like this. And in verse 9, he uses that language of, of taking off that old self with its practices. Because all these practices are practices that work against loving people. They are practices that destroy community. And that first list, so when you, when, you take off, when you take off your old self, okay, that's the slide there, you are taking off the practices that hurt people. And that first list in Colossians 3 is, in, and starting then in verse 5, is a list that has a whole bunch of things to do about sex, all right? Sexual immorality. We have sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. And then Paul ends with, and greed huh? Like, wait, what? I thought we were talking about like a list of sexual sins. Well, he ends it with greed. Why does he end it with greed, which he goes on then to say is idolatry? Well, this is a quote that I'm going to give directly to you, and it's going to be up here on the screen if you can't see it. It's a little small. Sorry about that, but this is from Walsh and Kiesmont. Why does he end the list of sexual sins with greed? Because sexual sin is fundamentally a matter of of covetousness, an insatiable, self-gratifying greed that has the control and consumption of the other as its ultimate desire. Sexual sin is sin not because it is sexual, but because it is invariably covetous. Sex itself is not a sin, but when it becomes covetous, that is what Paul is talking about here. It replaces the pleasure and sexual enjoyment of two people in a loving relationship with a self-centered gratification of sexual longings that can never be fulfilled apart from commitment. Such sin breaks the back of trust that is at the heart of the community. And it is a community that Paul is striving for and striving to build here in Classe. So 
when it comes to what we're taking off, we're taking off sins, things, parts of our earthly nature that kill community and hurt people. The practices in Paul's next list that he has here are also people hurters and community killers that we see as well in verse 8. You also must rid yourself of all things such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And then in verse 9, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. These are similar things to the list of sexual sins insofar as they have at their center an objectifying of someone else. The sexual sins objectify a person in order that we might consume them. The sins in the second list objectify a person with contempt in order that we might destroy them or hurt them. So there's a similarity in both of those lists because there's an objectification that happens in both cases. And these are the things of our old self that we need to get rid of because they kill community and they hurt people. This is what we are invited to take off. Now, what are we invited instead then to put on, right? Well, and actually, let me back up because I missed a part because there's this little, little piece in here that y'all are like, whoa, there's that really scary word, the wrath of God. Did I miss it? No, I'm coming back to it because it says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You know what? I'm not scared of the wrath of God. I want the wrath of God to come and kill all of those things in me that are killing other people and hurting other people and killing community. There is something, the wrath of God is the fire of God's love for this world. And God doesn't want any of the things that hurt us and hurt people and kill community. He wants a community of shalom. And so the wrath of God is something that I hope for in my life to help me put to death the things that kill community and hurt people. And those people who have been objectified and oppressed in some way, either because someone has objectified them to consume them or objectified them to destroy them, they too long and hope for the wrath of God to come, the wrath of God, which is God's love for his world in a fiery way, to come and consume all that is evil so that restorative justice can happen for the oppressed and the oppressor, so that community can be found, so that community can be built and people can be loved. We take off all that kills community, all that hurts people, and we put on love for people. And what does that look like? In Colossians 3, in our verses, he says, do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. And so when we put on our new self, we are being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creator. And the more that we image our creator and give our ultimate sovereignty to him, the more that we do this together in love for each other. Because imaging God is not something that we do alone. Imaging God is something that we do together with love for one another. And Paul tumbles right into those words of love in his statement about us as a community. Here in verse 11, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian. This kind of sounds like Galatians 3.28 from several weeks ago, doesn't it? Slave or free, right? But Christ is all and is in all. This is the love for one another that comes when we recognize that Christ is what matters most. He is the most important thing and he is at our center. And if we had time, and we're not going to get into this deeply, to look at verses 12 to 17, I think we would find the beauty of what putting on this new nature looks like. We've got beautiful words as God's chosen people, dearly loved, clothe yourself, right? This image of being clothed and come over with, with I'm sorry, where are we? Yes, with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Again, this sounds like Galatians 5 
the fruit of the Spirit, right? Bear with each other. Okay, I'm going to get back to that in a moment. It goes on. We talk about love and gratitude. And at the end, it talks about letting the Word dwell in us and worshiping God. And right in the middle, what I skip for a second, in verse 13, we have one verse with three word, one word used three different times. Right at the core of all of these virtues, one verse with one word used three different times, and that word is forgiveness. Forgiveness. If a community is to image the creator, if a community is to love each other, we have to be a community of forgiveness. Because though we have put off our old nature, there are ghosts of our earthly nature that haunt our community. And so, until Christ comes, what happens at the core of who we are is forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. That is the beginning of the restoration that we need in order to move forward together well. Somebody sent me a quote this week from Richard Rohr that talks about how love is like water. Remember when William was here last week? I think this spot is gone now. If you were here last week with the children's message, William poured water in an overflowing way into this cup to show, you know, how God's love and God's blessings just fill us to overflowing. Love is like water. It finds the lowest places. It always goes to the lowest places. Not to the highest places, but to the lowest places. To cleanse, to love, to heal. And Rora said that is why forgiveness is one of the most powerful pictures of love in action. Because it is at those low places and those dark places in our community life together that we need love and forgiveness to heal us and to transform us into a people that love each other. And finally, the third point of the triad of grace is hope for the future, right? In our earthly nature, we don't have a lot of hope for the future. In our earthly nature, we are very consumed with what is right in front of us, what is right at our feet. We are absorbed in the troubles and the things going on right here. And we tend to say, and I've said it, and I've heard it said, even in this last week, it is what it is. Right? How many of us have said this, right? How many times do we say this? It is what it is. There's no hope for the future. I'm just going to plod along, dealing with my stuff one step at a time, one day at a time, because it is what it is. Okay, there's truth in that. Sometimes there's nothing you can do, so we need to say it is what it is. But sometimes I'm like, if I hear that one more time, (laughs) right? God is calling us to a hope for a future. And if we are constantly in this place of cynicism and resignation that nothing can ever get better, that is not what we are being called to by Paul. We are being called to by Paul and by Christ to have a hope for the future. So we need to put that off. Next time you say it is what it is, think a minute. Is it really what it is? (laughs) Is there something else that God might be inviting me to? I'm saying that to myself, right? Preaching to myself here. The other piece about this text when it comes to the old self is when I think about all of these sins, these sins, these vices, these sexual sins, sins of greed, sins of anger, and all this stuff, those are practices of instant gratification, okay? Those are things that we do to get what we want immediately, either to consume someone else or to destroy someone else right now because that's how quickly I want it. They are short game practices to get what we want right now. The new self, when it comes to hope for the future that we are invited to put on, is a list of things that is all about the long game. The long game of building a community of love It's not always going to feel good right here, right now. It takes work to live in compassion and kindness and humility and forgiveness, which I always call the long miracle, and to love one another. This is, these are long game practices. But they are hope for the future. 
They are not immediate, instant gratification practices. They are, we're in this for the long haul, together practices. And what is hope for the future in this text without referring back once again to the very beginning? Set your minds on things above where Christ is, right? Not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There are a lot of things about our life that are hidden right now, that are safe, but also feel not quite revealed and not quite full and not quite whole. We're living between the now and the not yet. And there will be a time where all things will be revealed. And we too will be revealed for who we are as God's children, appearing with him in glory. And that is such a beautiful, hopeful vision for our life right now. To close this message, I just want to share a little story. And the story is why I have daisies right here. Pick one out. Okay. So... Tim and I were on a walk yesterday morning with the dog. And there was, we were dogs. We are dog sitting right now, so we have two big dogs in our house. This is the best way to come home from vacation, is to have two dogs. Anyway, so we're walking the dogs, and we're near the end of our walk, and we see somebody, not close neighbor, but somebody in our neighborhood, who, he's he's like maybe a guy 30 years old or something, working on his car. His car was up on like, what do you call those things that raise the wheels? What? Jack, Jacks. Oh, drove up on blocks. Okay, so the car, I'm just trying to paint a picture for you here, right? So the car is up, and he's, you know, got his grubby clothes on, and he's down there, and he's doing some good work on his car, and I was thinking to myself, we bring our car to people to do that thing. That's not what we do, and I'm like, wow, way to go, guy, doing the hard things, and yeah, and all of a sudden, this little girl, which I think is his daughter, comes out down the yard, maybe three years old, three years old. And she's got this little summer dress on. And her hair is like really white blonde and curly and the sun was just shining in it. And she had a, I don't know why this was so beautiful. She had a little daisy in her hand. And she like comes up to her dad. She said something and I couldn't quite make it out. And I was like, huh, I I don't even know if they're speaking English. I'm not sure if I heard that. And so we walked and I I said to Tim, "Were were, were they speaking English? And Tim said, yeah, I think so. I said, what did she say to him? And he said, I think she said, what are you doing down there? (laughs) To her dad. So her dad's working on the car. What are you doing down there? And I thought, what an image. I feel like this text and the Holy Spirit come to us in our life, you know, doing the hard things, working on the car and on the jacks and the whatever's, as good as that work is, right? But comes to us in all this beauty and youth and hope. It just says, what are you doing down there? Look up. Look up. And I was listening to the dad, even though I didn't, couldn't quite hear what he was saying. He just started engaging in a little conversation with his little girl. And they were just talking. I pray that the beauty and the light of this text and of the Holy Spirit comes to each one of us today. It says gently, what are you doing down there? And invites us to look up, to engage our faith in Christ, to love people, and to have hope for the future. Let's pray together. Dear God, We thank you for your love that comes to us in all sorts of ways. And the beauty of a little girl with a daisy and the truth of scripture that challenges us and comforts us all in one morning and your wrath that desires to burn up and refine all in us that is not about love for you and others. God, we pray that today you would give us hope for the future, that you would remind us that we 
are safe. There is no worse that can happen, that we died and our lives are now hidden with Christ in you. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will also appear with him. And we will dwell together under the new heavens, on the new earth, as the people that you love. And there will need, be no need of sun or moon, for you will be our light. You will, you will be our reconciliation, and you are our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together the song, He Will Hold Me Fast Now, okay? And when I think of that word fast, usually when I think of the word fast, I think of the word quick, right? But the word fast also means tight, also means secure, also means it's not going anywhere. So we, when we talk about Christ holding us fast, are talking about the one in whose grip we are. He will hold us fast, stand as the music begins, and join in song. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For I say loves me so. He will hold me fast. Those he saves are privilege of offering the prayers of the people as well today. Uh, it's one of, those, one of those times when I end up doing all the things. Tim was going to do it, but he's on call, so we get, get paged at any moment, right? So I prepared the prayers of the people today. Um, and it's a privilege. It's an honor to be able to offer those prayers. So let's, let's pray together. God, today we thank you that we are held by you in your fast grip. 
that our lives are hidden in Christ with you, that you are fast in us and we are fast in you. Hold us, we pray, through the unknowns and struggles of our lives. Hold fast the world, we pray, through this time of war in Ukraine, through wildfires in California, to floods in Kentucky, to heat waves all over. God, in the wake of the, the Pope being in our country right now, we pray that you would hold fast all of those who are engaged in truth and reconciliation, that you would hold fast the indigenous peoples of our country as they navigate the rivers and streams of forgiveness and apology. God, we pray that this is one step in a very long journey. And God, as we join in that navigation at various points, we pray that you would empower us to be responsive to the calls to action and to be part of truth and reconciliation. God, we pray that you would hold fast with your love our church community, our leadership, as we navigate the rivers and streams which flow from the actions of our denomination last month. Many of us feel uncertain about a lot of things, and so we pray that you would help us to trust that you will not lose us or forsake us, that your promises will last, and that you will guide us in all wisdom as we wait on you and seek your face. Give us hope for the future and trust that the future is in your hands. We pray for your fast hold on many of us and those we love in difficult health journeys. Agnes' sister, Clara, for healing from the surgery that she experienced to remove cancer. Erica's teammate, Bella, and her mysterious and heartbreaking deterioration. Arnold and his elongated journey with stubborn cancer spots. Jake and Dee Dee's niece, Lisa, and her pain and cancer treatments. Gary in the wake of his heart surgery. And so many others who are on our hearts and minds that we lift to you in this moment of silence. God, we also experience your loving hold on us in our joy and our anticipation. We think of next week when we'll celebrate communion together and to celebrate together Edward's profession of faith. We think of Gwen and Dakota's wedding coming up on the 13th the Athletes in Action sports camp here at Westside in a week and a day, and also the one at First CRC the week after that. God, also we um, rest in the afterglow of Wednesdays at Westside under Chloe's excellent leadership, and we anticipate a year of ministry that might look more like the years before COVID than ever has been in the last few years. God, we pray that you would hold us fast. Lord, sometimes your ministry to us is slow. Most times it's slow. But there are times where we need you quickly. And the psalmists call that out. Lord, come quickly to save me. And so we pray that in your will and as you see fit, that you would enter quickly situations that need your love and healing so immediately. God, we praise you for the moments where that happens. I think of Linda's sister and the way that you have healed her. I think of how quickly a heart can change when you come in with the fastness of your spirit and turn it around. God, sometimes your miracles are slow and sometimes they're quick. And so we pray that your fastness, whether that's through quickness or through a tight hold, would be present in our life today and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to Sister Doris, who's going to lead us in our offering cause today. Good morning. I am your, uh, my name is Doris, and I am your duty deacon this morning. As noted each week, your gifts may go toward the budget for Westside. However, 
Our featured cause this week is the Congregational Assistance Plan known as CAP. It is a faith-based resource through Shalem Mental Health Network, Restoring Hope. CAP began in 2006, and since then, CAP serves a growing number of churches with their counseling ministry. This counseling service is open to churches of any denomination. Mental health needs are best met when and where they emerge in communities themselves. That's why Shalem works to develop new innovative partnerships between congregations, workplaces, neighborhoods, and the professional mental health sector to restore hope to the hurting. The CAP model has also now been adapted for use in schools. For Westside, CAP will provide free counseling up to six sessions from a qualified master's degree level Christian counselor for congregants who have been members for at least one year and attend regularly. Please note that your gifts for this cause will go directly to Westside's CAP budget in support of our congregation. We now pass the plate for your offering, but you can also give through our website, the Bridge app, or by dropping off a check at the mailbox at the side door. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Holy Father, hallowed be your name. We are thankful for the opportunity to support this cause that provides counseling service for those in need through the CAP program. We ask that you place it on our hearts to be generous towards this cause for this Westside support system. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and King. Amen. Um, I just I just speak as one who has benefited from that program. I have an excellent therapist. We just finished our sixth session. So please, if you're wondering about that, want to know more about it, let me know. We're going to sing a song called Overcome. Um, and this is not a song we know well, so I just invite you to listen and sing as you are led. Um, and it just goes really well with a series about Jesus being the one who overcomes and comes over us. above, enthroned on the Father's love, destined to die, poured out for all mankind, God's only Son, perfect and spotless one, He never sinned but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory
sending us out, light in this broken for your gifts and for testifying your faith in Christ who comes over us by contributing to the gifts of the people. And thanks, Sister Doris. <coughs> I invite you to stand for God's blessing. And I don't think we have many announcements except if you're listening in prayer. If you read the newsletter, you know that next week we'll be celebrating communion together and also celebrating the public profession of faith of Edward who came to the elders and has professed his faith and we will publicly celebrate that on Sunday before he heads off to Guelph. So that is um, going to be a great celebration together. So friends, as we head into our week, I stretch my hands and God's blessing over you. And I say unto you, with God's spirit and power, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Our final song today, Fill Thou My Life, O Lord My God, in every part with praise, is one that I just remember singing when I was little so many times. So it is a heart song of our denomination, and it in many ways connects with the end of Colossians 3.17 where it says, whatever you do, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Father through Christ his Son. Our whole life, should be filled with praise. So I'll go to the other microphone. That's how we practice at least. And we're going to sing all of the verses, all three verses, a cappella to close today. Fill thou my life, O Lord my God. And the stand, because it gives me more diaphragm support. So here we go. All right. 